All right. Welcome, everyone, to the um, inaugural roundtable for the Dynamic Coalition on Small Island Developing States. Um, my name is Tracy Hackshaw, and joining me in co-chairing this meeting is my colleague, uh, Maureen Hilliard. I am from the Internet Society Trent Tobago chapter and also the Trent Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. And Maureen is from the Pacific Islands chapter of the Internet Society and is also the chair of the At-Large Advisory Committee for um, at the ICANN, in the ICANN environment. Welcome. Um, this session is our first meeting, and as the normally we do at Small Island States meetings, we do it in a round table format. So I just want to encourage everyone who is at the extremes to join us around the round table if you are not yet here, because that will be um, ideal if you're not shy. Um, and for those who are joining us for the first time, um, the idea for this meeting is that we're going to be planning our work going forward into 2019 and beyond as our first meeting. So the Dynamic Coalition was founded just this year in June 2019 after a series of um, roundtables that we've had at the IGF, I believe since 2012 or 2013. So we have concretized that, those roundtables into a formal session. And the um, plan, which I can't get up on the screen, unfortunately, because I can't figure out the French on the keyboard, um, and I can't get my password up. The action plan, which is on the um, website, which I'll pull up as well, which I changed separately. We're trying to get a, a 10 point action plan going today. Uh, and to do that, so I, what I'll do, I'll probably try and skip showing you the plan and move straight into the, the items on the agenda that will go into the plan. We have several rapporteurs in the room. I can, yes, I can see them have arrived. Thank you. And the rapporteurs will, will be capturing the, the comments that we make um, and trying to, to get that information in to our 10-point action plan going forward. Um, so what I would like to do now, maybe I'll ask Maureen to, to add her thoughts and introductory piece. Can everybody see what's on the screen? We're going to make it a little bit larger. A little bit larger. All right, so I'm getting it. That's the foot as I can go, I think, without getting kind of ridiculous with the thing. So Maureen, maybe you could um, join in and, and have a... Um, welcome, everybody. I'm not quite sure, is it? Yes, they say don't, don't be too close, otherwise okay. it's very, oh, okay. All right. very loud. Okay. Actually, they're all different, aren't they? Um, I'm sorry, I've lost my voice already. Um, just wanted to, um, I think it would be really good if we um, went round and introduced our, each other because we've got people here that I haven't seen before. It would be nice to, um, to find out who is here and who's really supporting the work that we're actually wanting to do um, in, this, uh, in this particular forum. Um, and we're going to be looking at a, you know, a range of, of issues, and I must admit, I sort of like, in my preparation, was sort of like just looking at it from the Pacific um, viewpoint, a lot of these uh, issues. But um, if we could just sort of like start from the back, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves very quickly and telling us where you come from so we can get a range, an idea of where, where we are. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Morgan Frost from the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE. Um, we focus on the intersection between democracy and the local private sector, and we have um, different programs on digital economy, so I was interested in learning more about this coalition. Um, hello everyone, my name is Rashida, and I'm from Ghana, a Youth IGF Fellow. Hello everyone, good morning. My name is Lily Edina Mboche from Ghana. I work with the Ghana Community Network Services Limited and um, the team lead for community engagement at the Hakla Foundation. At this, I'm, I'm also an Internet Society Youth 
uh, at IGFLO, and at, at this meeting, I volunteered to rapporteur. So I'll be capturing notes from here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Samuel Osemensa. I'm a media practitioner from Ghana, and I'm also a youth IGF. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Enoch from Nigeria. I'm a youth IGF fellow. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Teresa Horaisova from Diplo Foundation. We provide capacity development programs and we have a soft spot for small island developing states. Uh, by the way, we are also reporting from all sessions at the IGF, including this one. So if you want to miss something, just uh, go on our website and you will find it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Hilda Kong. I am from Uganda. I work with um, Zimba Women. Um, and um, a social enterprise that does capacity building for women in STEM. I'm a youth at IGF fellow and I'm here repertoireing as well, just like Lily. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Nyamazao and I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm the head of membership and capacity building for the Internet Society Zimbabwe chapter. And uh, I also run a project uh, called Green Spaces, which seeks to provide internet access for outdoor spaces. Uh, Bill Murdoch, I'm the IT manager with Clear Sky Connections. We're a project in Manitoba to run fiber into all 63 First Nation communities in Manitoba. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ethan. I'm a youth IGF fellow, just like quite a lot of you people in here, uh, and I'm repertorying this meeting. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicole Peter Patterson. I'm with uh, She Leads It and also Way Forward, focused on women's empowerment, um, focused on doing work in tech in the Caribbean. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ria Yaching. I'm uh, I am heading up the Covella Foundation. I also support uh, in an advisory capacity to the OECS Commission. Uh, I'm on the Commission for Communications Resilience and uh, I'm rapporteuring here today as well and supporting the DC. Hi there, my name is Jack. I'm a grad student at Carleton University in Canada. Um, I was mostly interested in the coalition, so I thought I'd come to observe today. Hello everyone, my name is Carlton Samuels. I'm from the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. I've been around there. IGF and internet governance issues for about 10 years. Um, hello, uh, my name is Daniel Bilopio. I'm a youth IGF fellow 2018. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Alvaro. I'm from Colombia and I'm part of the Center internet of Internet and Society in the University of Rosario. Hi, my name is Dennis Redeka. I'm a, uh, the founder of the Island Arc Project, which is an NGO that works in uh, small island states with um, intangible cultural heritage protection through ICTs. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Yao from China. I'm from the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Um, I'm from the Office for Cyber Affairs. I mainly focused on the cybersecurity and uh, in, uh, internet governance. And I'm interested in the cooperation be maybe between China and the United States, so um, I came here. Hello, I'm Ellen Strickland, I'm Policy Director for Internet New Zealand, and um, I'm here because I'm a former board member of the Pacific Island um, ISOC chapter and a researcher at the University of Queensland on Pacific Island ICT policy. Hello, I'm Carson from Tanzania. I'm part of the Youth IGF 2018. Hello, I'm Ahita from India. I'm part of the Youth IGF um, uh, Fellowship. Thank you. Stanley is my name from Papua New Guinea, Pacific Islands. I'm here as an ISOC IGF ambassador, member of Pacific Islands chapter of the Indian Society. Hi, my name is George Gobin. Uh, I'm representing the Trinidad and Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. Hi, my name is Wesley Gibbings. I'm a journalist from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm with the Association of Caribbean Media Workers. 
but I'm at the IGF as part of the International Freedom of Expression Exchange. I have a little background in, in this subject because um, for, in time for Rio Plus 10, I was part of the working group that put together the Education and Information Plan. All right, thank you very much. Um, so it's 12.44, so we are just four minutes because we have tight schedule, four minutes behind. Um, item two on the agenda, we want to touch on and discuss, just to reiterate, this is a round table, so there'll be no panelists for those who are familiar with all the talking heads. This is not a talking head session. So we're gonna be asking you to contribute directly in. Um, I guess if I don't hear any voices, I will ask you to speak. Um, so topic one, affordability and accessibility of internet usage, exploration of existing internet infrastructure and developments within SIDS. What we're trying to do here is assess whether or not any of the issues that relate to affordability and accessibility of internet usage are indeed applicable to small and developing states. And if so, what are the actions that need to be taken by a group like ourselves to improve or to enhance the challenges that small and developing states face. So as you see on the screen, we have kind of created a, a map of um, some of the things that we believe would be um, of interest under affordability, broadband, internet price control measures, under, -access under accessibility, the digital divide, the access through internet, internet intergovernmental agencies and related services, the role of community internet resources in education and social development, and under infrastructure development, inter-islands connectivity and IXPs, and the status of DNS sec deployment in small and developing states. Of course, that's not an exhaustive list. We have approximately 10 minutes for this discussion, so I'll open the floor I know it's a broad topic, to see if there are any points, observations that anyone would like to make. And if not, I will call upon my colleagues in the room who I know would want to contribute. So floor is open. And when I say open, I really mean open. Well, let me jump in here. Um, uh, my, uh, we, we tend to have the same problems. We have problems of accessibility and the accessibility is, there are several factors that, that are kind of imposed on this issue. Uh, there is uh, accessibility because of costs. We, it's affordability, it's not affordable. We have uh, some issues with uh, literacy and we have some issues pertaining infrastructure and regulation. Part of the problem we have in our states is uh, creating a cohesive framework of action that allows you to deal with all of them because some, these issues are interconnected. And one of the uh, areas I think we have to do is look at deliberately uh, creating a framework of action so that we can beat this uh, issue. Uh, the first one, uh, in my view, is that we should always uh, promote uh, community networks as a way to connect those at the edge and those underrepresented. And if you're going to produce community networks, you have to have a regulatory uh, framework that allows you to uh, deploy infrastructure. By that I mean, you have to have, uh, and I'm thinking Wi-Fi in this case, uh, bandwidth and spectrum availability. And it could mean that you have to influence the regulatory uh, uh, framework for spectrum management. Um, we see TV white spaces and the digital dividend when you go to digital broadcasting as providing uh, opportunities for uh, improvement of the uh, bandwidth uh, and uh, the, the spectrum for bandwidth. Um, then you have to have anchor uh, institutions. Uh, we've tried the community access point routes and most of you would know the community access point. There's a real problem of sustainability with them. 
and maybe what we have to do is to look for different anchors because the community access points were meant to anchor the development of the community networks. And I'm thinking we should look for new institutions. In my own view, the library system is probably one of the best positioned to become uh, anchor points for community access points and therefore uh, building community networks around that. The library also, at least in our region, they're developing their own digital assets. They are developing databases of digital uh, assets um, because they are very much involved in uh, information literacy training and computer literacy training. And over this period, they've developed some assets that can be utilized. What, what we're talking about is that even if you do not have day-to-day -day internet access because you're still going to have problems at backhaul to the internet. Uh, um, and that's where uh, the price and the cost comes in. Um, you should at least aim for developing a community intranet <laughs> because that will have value in itself if you look at what's happening, if you look at places around the Caribbean and Jamaica, we had a white spaced project that developed in the Rio Grande Valley that connected some schools and health centers together. Um, I know in Belize, they've had uh, projects that uh, are connecting their, their public health um, system, their health aids in, in, in a network where they can produce uh, data and information for them. The point I'm making here is there are enough applications available to sustain a community intranet, even if we only have um, uh, episodic <laughs> connections to internet because of the cost of the backhaul to the internet. Uh, but as you see, it, it is a whole set of things that need to work together and it requires collaboration. So my own view is that we have all the pieces, we know all the pieces that can work and can be sustainable. What we have to do is like in this coalition, develop coalitions of practice and develop uh, a collaborative frameworks to allow us to put the pieces together. So that's my contribution, thank you. All right, thank you. That was Carlton Samuels from Tram Tobago. Um, I believe there are remote participants on. Um, so the remote participants who are listening, feel free to, to make your, your observations. Um, we have a remote art moderator, and let, we, we would inter, have you intervene as, accordingly. Um, right, so moving on with, we have five, well, just about five minutes left on this topic, unfortunately. So are there any other interventions from the audience? All right, I, I, I caught, caught your, your eyes, you caught my eyes. Okay, so I, I do want to spin off of something that uh, Carlton talked about, um, but before I, before I go there, just very quickly, uh, the Caribbean has made some significant progress as it, as, we, as it relates to the affordability index um, for those who have access, so we will qualify it that way. Um, we do have some outliers that do need uh, a lot of attention still. I will still name Jamaica as one of them. Um, we have uh, significant opportunities in Belize, Guyana, Suriname, and so on. But if you look at where we fall in the sort of broadband commission sort of index, 5% of GNI and so on, the vast majority of the, of the Caribbean falls well within that range. That being said, uh, the, the price and aff affordability factor within the context of accessibility can't be denied. And Carlton is extremely um, right in, in describing that. I want to spin a little bit off of mainstream connectivity and access and talk about emergency connectivity and access as well. We are highly vulnerable as a region, both the Pacific and the Caribbean. And uh, if 2017 taught us anything, it taught us that the existing infrastructure and models uh, need to be looked at immediately um, in, in our bundle of solutions as we move forward. It is not simply uh, an issue of just uh, talking about access uh, from a single solution aspect, 
but making sure we have diversity in our opportunities and options. And as Carlton very rightly put it, uh, a set of regulatory frameworks that are flexible enough to be able to accommodate that. So as I sat on the Commission uh, for Communications Resilience, um, uh, I was uh, charged with reviewing some of the new and emerging technologies that came to the fore. Everyone was coming to us. So we have Alphabet Loom, we had uh, OneWeb, we had Sky and Space Global, we had TV White Space. We have a number of suppliers uh, and emerging technologies, all of which have, had, have seen significant reductions in price or go-to-market strategies that can actually make this affordable to us. HAP technologies as well, uh, uh, satellite phones, all of it. And to his point, the regulatory frameworks that surround uh, these new technologies are not in place yet. And so nine months later, 10 months later, and we have yet to see uh, significant deployments uh, or even pilot tests in any of these that can both help us in an emergency access uh, opportunity, but also reach last mile, also reach rural access, also combine in community networks opportunity to, uh, to fulfill our accessibility aspirations. And that's where I leave it. Thank you, um, Ria Yoching. Um, I recognize the, Mr. Wesley Gibbons from um, the Media Workers Association, but the, um, I'd like to put you on a bit of a spot, given that your time is running out. Perhaps when you make a contribution, if you could end with one or two action points that we could add to the action plan that we want to go forward for the benefit of the, the session. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to add um, a few lines. Um, but what Ria just said strikes a very familiar chord. Following the events of, in the Caribbean in 2017, my organization did a review of media performance um, during the emergencies in, in Dominica, Antigua, and some of the other islands. And the emergency response mechanisms, the emergency communication mechanisms, were non-existent practically. Okay? Um, and, and, and the interface with, with the mainstream um, communication flows, media in particular, but not only media, of course, others. In Trinidad and Tobago, we just had a big flooding episode. You had, uh, that, that came to the fore as well. But, um, but I wanted to also, so, so that is said, that, that's fully endorsed. Um, in terms of the, in, the we, there's a tendency to look uh, very heavily at the infrastructure issues. And those things are all requirements. I know a little bit about the situation in the Pacific, having done some work there myself. Um, and there are serious deficits there in terms of the hardware and the regulatory framework to, to, um, to govern um, the manner in which. But there's, there's these to me a, a, a look at the content issues. Um, when um, my colleague from UE spoke, he mentioned in passing the literacy issue. And I think above and beyond old-fashioned classical literacy and illiteracy, which remain problems in, in a lot of our territories, um, digital literacy needs to be looked at in terms of um, assisting people to make sense of what's flowing through these conduits that we are speaking about um, being established. So I, if I had to put an action, I would say that you should perhaps add, it's, it's there, I know, implicitly, but there perhaps needs to be explicit mention of on the, on the content side in terms of um, raising awareness of uh, and, and, and abilities within our communities to inter interpret the huge mass and the, the, the increase in, in flows through these conduits, that information conduits we are creating. Uh, thank you very much. And trying to be a, a, a strict um, time manager here. We are three minutes over our, where we're supposed to be now. So I would um, want to move on with your permission to item three. Item three. And I'll ask, maybe I'll ask Maureen to, to lead us through this. Um, Maureen, can you, can, you have a, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Um, actually, I just wanted, uh, if, you know, if you pull, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the, um, the uh, community inter intranet. I mean, I'm sure my um, Pacific colleagues will, um, will sort of like agree with me that we actually have a, a sort of like an intranet courtesy of the um, Internet Society. Um, in that there is a, um, across the Pacific, there's actually a, a, a mailing list. 
and we have you know, about, you know, all our members are, have the opportunity to, um, to communicate with each other. And I think that that's been an amazing sort of like um, mechanism for us, and it could be possible through your um, internet society as well. But it is an amazing mechanism for actually putting our finger on the pulse of what is actually important within the, within the community. And I mean, the, um, there are issues. I mean, all the issues that, that has, have been mentioned already, um, I, you know, like I mean, they're of course common. But the thing is that um, I mean, the, the, the digital assets and things like that. That's you know, like I mean, that's a given. One of the things that uh, often comes up. In, um, in, within uh, Pacific meetings and that is cyber security. I mean, it's, a, it's a just a major issue. But when it comes to, um, you know, like, I mean, the practicalities of it, I mean, I just noticed that, um, for example, there's only three of our 22 countries and territories that have actually got a cert. Um, uh, and we've got only 52% of our, of our Pacific Islands are actually have a uh, DNSSEC. So, you know, like, they, they realise what the issues are, but I mean it's convincing government sometimes. In, in, in order. So the, you know that the, the high level um, sort of like uh, contribution that we could perhaps work together, you know, in our um, in our sort of like in this coalition to sort of like develop, um, you know, sort of like some kind of um, strategy that we can present to governments that are actually going to make them more aware and of the of the importance of it, especially in the emergency. Um, sort of like side of things, but you know, like I mean, I from that, that's just my point of view. But I'd be, um, you know, willing to listen to others, especially from the Pacific. <laughs> I actually have have a couple a couple here to support me today. Yeah, we're moving on to the item three, Murray. If you could lead us through item three. Do you Maureen? want to go? I mean, people might want to make some their own comments a bit on this. Social development mainly, but um, I definitely in the area of the women and girls in ICT. I mean, Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, the one pager, I don't, I don't see any reference specifically to the the gender divide issues, and I think that's something that we need to be very cognizant of. Um, even though my work is focused looking at the Caribbean, um, we know the situation in in most of the developing countries and, of course, across the small, small island development states. So um, I think it's something that we can't uh, overlook. Um, E, notwithstanding the fact that, for instance, um, some presentation or discussion with uh, colleagues from Facebook, for instance, that Jamaica actually has more women than men who are on Facebook. But it doesn't mean that, and that's, that's just an overall figure, but it doesn't mean that the level of digital literacy and digital skills are actually there. Um, just in terms of maybe some of looking at possible solutions, what can we do? Um, one of the first things that we're seeing um, within our group is that we want to try and work with others within the ITU um, Equal Skills Coalition to identify exactly what is our situation with regards to what's the baseline. And I think it may be something that we could look at doing in the other regions within the SIDS as well, so that um, you know we can have clear information. Because especially when it comes down to resilience, we know, of course, that women are the ones that are maybe left at home on that type of thing with regards to trying to respond in the event of the, the disaster event, in the the um, the natural event hurricanes and that kind of thing that we're facing in, in all our different regions. So that's a key part that we want to make sure that is linked in, in there. So I think we definitely, not I think, I would like to recommend that we definitely have to insert some language there. And I think um, some of the colleagues, um, Ayana Samuels and, and Bridget Lewis had submitted some information. So I can just work with you guys to make sure that we have that inserted. I know that when we were sort of like putting together our one pager, and it was uh, mainly based on what we were um, ha had been like, for example, in the Pacific, yeah, um, was to do with the AP, um, APRIGF and the issues that came out of that, 
and um, you know, like I guess they were the things that were on top. But I certainly do agree with you, and especially when we're looking in emergency services and making sure that our women and elderly and children, you know, every you know those uh, vulnerable groups are actually sort of located for, and, and we should be doing it as a as a collective because we we'll share the same you know same problems. So the um, item that we're dealing with on, on item three, we're looking for action items. I mean, I, I know we're discussing it, but um, can we concretize the discussion to getting some points that we would like to proceed with? Um, as you know, in the, 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 the list we have, it's, a long, it's an extremely long list, unfortunately. Um, but we do have the gender issue um, there. We, are, we, we bring up the, the resilience issue as well. Um, but we have a series of issues, cybersecurity, regulatory, content development, everything down to blockchain. I mean, it's a whole list of potential um, actions that we could take. I know it's a lot to digest in this short time, but I would like to ask if we could zero in on some action items um, when we contribute going forward. Thanks. Can I uh, talk a little bit about um, local content development? <laughs> this is a topic that is near and dear to all of us <laughs> in, from the Caribbean, I know for sure. We've been at it for quite a while. Um, the, the, we, we have um, some issues. Uh, George is here, um, and George can say something about that. We, we, we've always had a, a reputation of having uh, gifted programmers. <clears throat> we have them. Uh, the problem is that is we lose them, the brain drain situation. We lose them very rapidly. And George and I go way back in this business, and we can tell you stories about people we've employed and people we've trained, and as soon as we employ and train them, they move north. And so uh, you're not going to combat that because of the, uh, the, the opportunities and the enticements from up north are hard to overcome especially when you have youngsters and growing families and so on. So it, it can't be a way for you to try to stop that. That's not going to be useful. So what we have to do is to develop a way to develop more of them. <coughs> we just have to produce more of them. Um, and um, the way we're going about that uh, is, 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 uh, is in fits and starts. Um, we're seeing, uh, I'm chairman of, of, of a school board, a secondary school board, and we're seeing for the last three um, cycles, three academic years, there are more girls that are taking uh, IT and computer science, and STEM, STEM, thank you, Lorea. There, there are more girls in STEM. <laughs> the problem is that they need to be nurtured probably a lot more than the boys. And, and what we need is more mentors for them. That's what we need more than anything else. It do, doesn't mean that you have to know how to write a program or you have to, you have to know how to do a chemistry experiment. What it means, though, is that you're available to them to bounce ideas off and talk. This is where collaboration comes in, because you might not know the answer, but you might know somebody who knows the answer. <laughs> And so we have to have a chain of collaborations to develop more of them. That is going to be the solution. We have to just develop more of them. And they are there and willing. And from the trends we are seeing in this, at the secondary level, they seem to be um, in, 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 in enthusiastic about participating. So I am making the appeal for more mentors. We have to get out of the idea that a mentor has to have a certain profile. That's one profile. So that's not true anymore. Uh, George, I'm sure you have some, some things you can add to this. <laughs> yeah, Carlton, you're right. We have discussed this, this uh, issue time and time again, and I think education in our regions is what is most needed. And I want to say education from two reasons. We can't ever stop the brain drain. What we need to do is make advantage, take advantage of the diaspora coming back or giving back to our countries. And the second thing is on education is the ability to figure out or to even help. Wesley was talking about you know 
emergency alerts and, and, and maybe Rio also, but how, does we, how do we educate our populations to discern what is fake and what is not fake? Over the last couple of emergencies that we've had in the Caribbean especially, we've seen lots of fake news about pictures that even didn't come from our region saying that they were happening in our region. So I think we've got to go through this education process where we educate users of our technology systems how to discern what is real and what is not. If I can just, um, sort of like just throw something in here at the moment. Um, at the moment, I'm sort of like developing our ICT strategy in the Cook Islands, which is really cool. But one of the things that we, um, and of course, we, being a small island, you know, we have quite a lot of uh, an association with, uh, with donors. The Indian government is actually contributing to a program and to develop a, 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 an initiative within the Cook Islands where they work with the graduates. We have um, several graduates through the um, United, University of South Pacific um, in, in information systems. They'd like to work with those graduates and um, to assess what the needs are in the business and government sectors and then train, uh, to find out what the needs are and then train them in what the courses of, of need. And so that what happens is that we develop incubators, like a, an incubator um, program, where the students actually develop solutions for community needs. And the training actually builds the skills that they need to do that, to do those, to, you know, to, to supply those needs. And I think that this is probably one of, you know, it's, a, it's an innovation that is actually sort of like doing what, you know, what you're saying is that they get trained and they produce the solutions, they stay on the island. And this is what we're, and we're actually getting our locals to do the, you know, to, to create the solutions. And in, in most, um, you know, in, um, in the past, you know, all that has been outsourced. You know, we're bringing people in when we know our, our kids can do that themselves. So it's customised training. So something we can do. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. And I understand we have a remote intervention, so let's give that remote uh, intervention some, some attention. Um, please go ahead. Who's speaking? From the Trinidad and Tobago Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. Um, I wanted to follow up on Carlton's, this, um, George's actually point about using the diaspora and um, note that Jamaica has a very, very interesting project that they have about that uses the diaspora of Jamaicans abroad to interact with students and people and particular groups of items in that are needed in Jamaica, for example. I was talking to Peter Harrison the other day and they have an ICT diaspora team and they use people in the diaspora to have um, fellowships and so forth for Jamaicans in their companies in the US and UK and so forth. And that might be something that we could look at for all the various countries to utilize the diaspora to help us with the education and also be able to say, hey, you can switch back and forth, but you can still give back and use your skills to do work and help in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was Jacqueline Morris. Okay. Yes. Um, I reckon um, yes, go ahead, um, Nicole. I press the green side too. <laughs> um, uh, thanks. Two things. One, what you were mentioning before in terms of the um, initiative with India. Um, maybe that's something that we could expand uh, wider because we have a lot of engagement with India within the Caribbean region as well. and, and, and um, 
most unquestionably across Africa. That's one thought. But the other thing is that um, I was reaching out to a colleague who is with, I don't know if you've heard of, Haka Hostel, which is an, is an initiative um, in the Caribbean, I think, Jamaica, and they work in a number of different places. But that question of retaining that, the talent so that we don't have the brain drain, I think especially when we think in, look in terms of future work, that the fact that we have that um, developed and developing or well-developed um, internet connectivity relatively, that it opens the opportunity for staying in the country where you are and working in a different way. And so one of the things that we're doing with the initiative that I lead, which is Girls in ICT, the Caribbean Hackathon, is that in terms of engaging them in the, the, from upper level of high school and in the university, but the idea idea being to get into that pipeline also of those that maybe whether we call them you know they work for themselves or that kind of thing but it, it, it may be something that we could see with either I don't know if the IGF group or with ISOC because I'm outside of the internet group itself I'm more on the development side to develop a cadre or a pool that is known of people that can be pulled on that as part of resource for different projects. Because even in the case of what Hacker Hostel has been doing, they've done projects in Trinidad, for instance, that they're doing work for clients that are in other parts of the world also in Jamaica and that kind of thing. And there are many models that we can pull on, for instance, such as Andelo, which is based out of Nairobi, where it's the same idea of virtual, not um, data entry, but virtual, well-developed um, tech skills that can be, can be provided. So I think that that's one area that we definitely need to look at. And that has two aspects to it, as you were mentioning, both the gender lens aspect as well as, of course, making sure that you're going across other arms, uh, both male and female. The other thing that you were mentioning, Carlton, is um, I'd love to follow up with you to see where we can make sure to ensure that those girls that are coming out of the programs, um, whether it's at University of the West Indies or other universities and that kind of thing, that we can make them available on an ongoing basis as virtual mentors. And this is what we can do across regions as well, too you know, develop a program that is on an ongoing basis. You know, you have million mentors. There are a lot of mentorship programs that are out there already. Google Tech is invent in interested in doing a lot of these kinds of things. So let's get together and pull, to work, um, pull some specific actions, as you're asking for, um, Tracy, that we can actually make this a reality. Item four. <laughs> we need to identify the actions and pull it together. Um, for the, because for, remember this is a dynamic coalition, so we have to ensure that the outcomes for this session are specific and we can document them. So we'd like to ensure that now we just drive, we have 10 minutes left, drive right down to these action items. So if you have that going, let, let, let's move, let's go. All right, let me, um, let me add, um, specifically on the area of uh, gender and, and ICT, um, what isn't measured isn't managed. So we need to begin from the beginning, uh, starting to benchmark ourselves wh where we are with this situation. Men mentoring is one aspect um, that can be measured as well, uh, but we need to also insert a gender um, mechanism into all of our ICT policies. This is a policy forum. Um, we need to be able to include it in our development plans. Um, any program that we are uh, going out with uh, when it comes to uh, diversity, uh, we must have, as, uh, as Nicole pointed out, it, it, the, the word, the gender lens, and, uh, and that will help us in, in moving forward in, uh, in understanding the scope and nature uh, of the problem. Um, number two, on the issue of local content, uh, a very interesting project, um, uh, as, as I was working with Facebook, um, on trying to, uh, trying to help them with uh, the Caribbean language, in, in, I mean literally, uh, to improve their community management process within the Caribbean. Um, I came upon this, this situation where uh, they can't really help us um, as much as they would like to in the whole issue of fake news and all of that. And as I, as I, spun, as I spun the local content a different way, I realized that, uh, that we can actually 
combine these platform views and take on a, a local content view in a slightly different way. So I'd like to include a, a, an outreach to, to companies or platforms like Facebook, Google, and so on to get our local content dialect, um, language, uh, euphemisms, and so on built into their algorithms to be able to help support how, uh, how you know, they support us in the region and then how our content gets bubbled up um, to get more sight uh, across. Uh, and so it takes on a, a push-pull versus a pull-push view uh, and, and therefore more holistic in, in, in the local content aspect. We're looking for the action. Thank you, Ria. We're looking for the action items. And then we got at least two from Ria there. Um, so I saw Nicole's hand first, so let's Nicole and then we go to Cartier. Yeah. yeah, don't want to hog the show, but um, as, as per specific actions, excellent that you just mentioned, Rhea, what isn't uh, measured isn't managed. One of the initiatives that we are pushing forward with now is to develop um, some work with UN ECLAC and a few others to do exactly that, to see what is our status of uh, digital literacy skills within the Caribbean. Um, to the extent that we could expand that to include uh, uh, the Pacific, that's something that I think we should really look at doing. UNA CLAC is not in the Pacific, so it would just be a matter of what, who the partner there is. But the other thing, so that's one, just to, to, to indicate that, but the specific action, Tracy, is to indicate in this um, going forward that we would like to have DC SIDS as a partner in that, um, both because there is a lot of um, expertise that is within the Caribbean that we would like to draw on, and also to know in terms of like who um, others may have as partners, whether it's Facebook or Google or others and that kind of thing. I'm also doing a follow-up meeting with GSMA, you know, so that we don't reinvent the wheel. So. The specific action is yes, and we need your, and we would like to also have your endorsement for um, the research that's going to be done on the agenda. Can I uh, uh, plug up for the open data initi initiative? Um, there's, uh, we have, have an open data initiative going across the Caribbean for several years now, and they're in the process of. Uh, kind of uh, accounting for all of the open data sets that are available. I know, you know, um, Patrick is in. Patrick has several data sets available on his platform in Trinidad. We have some at the University of West Indies through um, the Open Data Institute, and my colleague uh, Maurice McNaughton is involved there. But one of the things that they have been doing is that they've been uh, accounting all of the open data sets and accumulating open data sets. And of course, they're looking for applications that are built on top of the open data to valorize the data as well as to foment uh, content development <laughs> around that data. And that is something that we can, that we can pull into. Um, what has happened is that a couple of the governments in the region have actually embraced the open data initiative and concept. They're still working on some of the frameworks of how to make the data open, how to manage it, and so on. But I think if we, if we work with these uh, uh, people that are already down the road on this open data initiative, it is a part of getting the content development going in the region. And it is something that is it's a low-hanging fruit, as it were, that we can add some value to. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I'm very cognizant of time. So what I would like to do is perhaps ask one of the rapporteurs to sort of summarize the last set of points quickly. And we'll see if there's anything missing that we want to add thereafter, and then we wrap the meeting up. So who would like to volunteer from the rapporteur team to summarize the last few points that were raised to make sure we have it documented? All right, I'm seeing... Ethan Sweet would like to volunteer. Okay, let's see how well this goes. <laughs> um, so, so just the last few points, yeah? Okay. Um, so we've already had, just from you right now, the um, Open Data Initiative, how this is already there and we should take hold of it and use it. Um, we've had from, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, 
Thank you. <laughs> I'll write it down properly on here in a moment. Um, we've had that we. Uh, we've had from a cross stream actually that what isn't measured isn't going to be managed so we need to keep keep our tabs on these things so for example um so for example you uh pointed out a un agency i believe that is doing this um yeah and we and we could expand this through to the specific and uh that dc should, should partner on that uh scrolling up a bit more um we had a hack hustle um so that was the uh system that was the system to attempt to one of the systems to attempt to prevent brain drain because brain drain from the Caribbean to uh, the north is pretty severe and isn't really going to just stop so um, one nice one way of doing it as you said is to incubate them in the country on things that matter in the country and then they might not leave that's always nice um, and you want me to keep going or how far up should I scroll I've got a big document here and it's like 800 words All right, maybe we, could, so we could pause there are there, is there anything missing, again, getting down to the actions that we need to take and we're going to add? So, Maureen, yes, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that when we're, like, putting together these sorts of ideas that have come through today, I think as long as it's in some kind of framework that, you know, like, I mean, we can sort of see how things are going to be connecting to each other um, because they, they are related. Um, and also I think we can very much say that you know like whatever is being developed for the Caribbean definitely would be um, you know helpful and for the Pacific and um, but you know like there is another group um, of small island states who ha you know like who haven't been um, participating with us as much as we you know we've got to reach out to them as well um, and I think that there are the, um, the the items that have been raised already and, and also, like for example, I was very interested when you, the very first thing you mentioned was the affordability thing and you said that there have been developments already. I would be very interested in hearing about those because that's a real big issue in the Pacific. So, um, and we haven't been able to deal with it. So if you've got some ideas that would help us, that would be um, great as well. But I just think that this should be some sort of structure, that's all. Yes, definitely. Ethan, you, would you, are you going to go ahead then? Yes, no, I, I, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, in the last few minutes, um, just like to make one more call for any action items that would want to go down. Because remember, we are just repeating. We are dynamic coalition. This is not a workshop. So, we are trying to get a, a plan together to present to the UN. Um, there's possible funding. I don't know what's what's available but we're gonna get this plan approved and take it forward for the next year or two. So within this plan, we want to ensure that everything that we'd like to get done is there. So let's ensure that that happens if, as we're talking it through. Um, we have two minutes left, so if that's the case, um, I'm seeing some, now that I've said, I'm seeing some, some points coming up quickly. I just wanna add, take a topic that wasn't actually talked about um, and, and throw in an action item. Uh, the law enforcement challenges in combating cybercrime. Um, uh, also, with some of my work with Facebook, I want, to, I want to make an appeal through this DC that we can actually approach many of these platforms to help in, the, in supporting uh, some of the um, rogue elements, if you will, but it just means more of a, a structured partnership with the various uh, groups within these organizations, and in doing that, uh, we have closer eyes on our own because again they have more data on us than we have on ourselves mm -hmm. and we need to work with them to mine it mm -hmm. and uh, and that makes uh, that break uh, breaks down the barrier between ourselves and the law enforcement agencies who them of themselves don't have those various types of networks that we do and uh, and so we, we bring this cycle of partnership in uh, in cybercrime that brings it closer to, um, uh, to more traction Maureen, do you have anything to, to, no. to wrap up? Okay. So with that, um, again, we only had one hour, unfortunately, this year. But um, I'd like to wrap up the session. It's very tight. But I think we got some, some thing done, some work done. Very, um, we'll continue this discussion online in the, in the mailing list and hopefully more platforms that we'll establish. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today in this very rapid inaugural meeting of the DC SIDS and thank all the rapporteurs who um, did a fantastic job, I'm sure. 
and for Ethan for volunteering to to kind of collate what the uh, verbally what the, the points were. Um, I'd just like to make one round of officially trying to validate the action plan. So assuming we have one written just by acc acclamation. So um, I'm assuming therefore that there's no dissent or no disagreement for this plan. And if there is, speak now. Otherwise, otherwise I would think we would want to give us a round of applause to acclaim and to close the meeting um, for our first meeting and for getting an action plan going. Let's go. Thank you very much and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.